give you all the praise, oh God. We give you all the praise, oh God. We give you all the praise, oh God, because you're worthy of it, Lord. Truly, oh God, you are a God. You are a God. You are our God, and there is none like unto you in all the earth.
you, O God. We exalt you, O God, to the highest place. We exalt you, O God, the highest that we are able to lift you. Oh Lord, you deserve so much more than we can give. But oh God, all that we have, we lift you, oh God, with all that we have, with all that we know and all that we understand. Mighty God, with all that is in our hearts, all of our gratitude, all, oh Father God, of our insight, all of the revelation that we have of you, we exalt you with it, oh God. We exalt you with all our strength, with all our might, with all, oh God, our mind. Lord, we exalt you. We exalt you. Lift up your voices and exalt him tonight. Exalt him from all that he has placed on the inside of you. Exalt him from all that he has ever done for you. Lift them to the highest place that you can. Lift your hands to the highest that it could be lifted unto him tonight. Because he alone is worthy. Lord, we worship you. We exalt you. We exalt you. Almighty oh, Jesus, be exalted, be exalted. Exalted in spirit and truth tonight. Oh God, above all things tonight, Lord. Oh, you are exalted. Take all that we offer, all that we offer. and just lay it down before him give it as an offering tonight give him an offering of your worship an offering of your praise oh he receives it tonight hallelujah just one more time we exalt you we exalt you we exalt you jesus Mighty God, I lift up your people tonight. Mighty God, they've come through the day, oh God, and some, Lord, they're weary, some are tired. But oh, mighty God, they're here tonight. And Lord God, right now I pray that you will just breathe upon your people, that you would refresh, oh Father God, that oh God, you will lift burdens, oh God, that you will break chains. That mighty God, you will just wash over this congregation tonight, oh God. Wash our minds, oh Father. Mighty God, every distraction, every thought that could come, oh God, we ask that by your might and your power, that you will free the minds of your people tonight. Lord God, that every burden and every care roll off in your presence. Precious Holy God, oh Lord, that you will move among your people, that you will walk in these aisles, oh God. Lord, you know the hearts of every individual individual you know where we are and you know what we need and great and awesome limitless God tonight we pray oh God that you will meet every individual at the point of their need tonight we bless you we honor you we thank you you're such a good God such a good God we bless you oh God hallelujah 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated in his presence. Thank you, worshipers. Hallelujah. The title of the sharing tonight, most of you all will know it already. It's tapping into the limitlessness of God. Hallelujah. As infinite man, it is difficult to fathom. And as finite man, I should say, it is difficult to fathom an infinite God. And that is why sometimes man is always trying to bring God down to his level. They feel that if we could get God to be like us, not us like God, but if we could get God to be like us, we'll be okay. But the idea of the limitless God, God being limitless, is mind-blowing. It really is mind-blowing. When you think of God who is before time, we know time, but God is before time. He exists in a realm that is not subject to or governed by time. God dwells in eternity where it is always forever. Could you think about dwelling where it's always forever? He only measures time to be able to relate to us because we exist in time. But God, he is beyond time. And this is why when people and have a, they, they have encounters with heaven and things like this, you, they have no clue how long they were there. Because time in our realm, there's no time when they get there. So they, they can't fathom it. So when they think that it has been hours, it could be seconds. I remember hearing a testimony of a guy, it's a little echoey, I don't know if you all could fix that. I remember hearing the testimony of a guy who, he had this experience and, you know, he went up to heaven and he went through a whole tour. He, he um, God instructed him, he went through, so much seemed to happen. He, he thought it might have been even hours or days. And when he came back, it turns out that he was only gone for, his heart had stopped. And before they could heat up the paddles to start his heart back again, he was back in his body. But he thought that hours had passed and it was that quick. Because when you move into that realm, there is no time. They couldn't, didn't even get to defibrillate him yet. There was no time. It is a realm not measured by time. So anyone in heaven has already been there in what we will understand as forever. Anyone who is in hell, they've already been there forever. You see, we, in time, we would say, well, 5,000 years. We would say, oh my gosh, they've been in hell for 5,000 years. But there is no time. So from the time you get there, it's forever. I remember a guy even sharing a testimony. He shared about having that encounter with hell. And he said he found himself in this very dark place where the darkness felt as though it was moving in on you. It felt as though, you know, the darkness was alive. And he said he got there and he felt such extreme hopelessness. He felt as though this would always be his life. There, there was nothing else. And for him, it had already felt like it was forever until he saw the light of God and, you know, however he came out and so. But he, when he came back, he was like, it was unimaginable how, how permanent it felt when he was there. So, so I'm saying all that to say that it's a realm that's not really measured by time. This is, this is really for us to just fathom God. A little bit. And this is why the scripture says that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. Because he, you cannot box him in with time. He only deals with time for us. So do you know that we can't even waste God's time? 
You realize we could only waste our time. Because we are the ones limited by time. You can't waste God's time. Do you know that we cannot waste God's resources? Because there's no limit to what he has. There's no limit to his resources. But what he will do, he will look to see how we handle it. How we steward it. And it reveals our heart. But we can't really waste God's resources. Nothing that God has could ever run out. Therefore, we cannot bankrupt God. How many of you all know that are going somewhere with this? We can't bankrupt God. He is limitless. He is timeless. He is ageless. He is endless. That is our God. Do you know that the concept of all does not even relate to God? Because all is still measurable. It's still a measure. So it doesn't even relate to him because he is immeasurable. I don't know if we could wrap our minds around who our God is. When we sing this song, there is no limit. There really is no limit to the God that we serve. So when you think about it, we could just say that God just is. He just is. And the scripture tells us this. It says it, that, you know, that we should, the very essence of our faith is, Hebrews eleven six, 6, where it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. But then it explains what the essence of our faith should be. It's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Because he always is. He never was and he never will be. He always is. And somehow it is important for us to see God this way, that God, he is. There's nothing, there's no, there are no boundaries. There are no measures. He is everything and more. Everything. He just is. He's not limited by any thought or imagination that we might have. Because we all have some measure of how we think about God. But he's not limited by that. What we think of him, what we have decided to believe or not believe, does not affect God. It just affects us. If we decide to believe that there is no heaven or no hell, it changes nothing for God. It only affects us in our mind. So he's not limited by our thoughts or imagination. He's not limited by any measure of understanding that we might have. Because we tend to relate to God based on how much we understand. How much revelation of him that we got. It doesn't change who he is. It helps us to be able to elevate our place and to be able to relate to him in another measure. But it doesn't change who he is because he's everything. He's everything. Whatever we could imagine, he's beyond that. Whatever we think, he's beyond that. There's a scripture in Ephesians 3 and verse 20. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all, above all that we ask or think. So if you could ask it, he will do beyond that. If you could think it, he will go beyond that. That's the God that we serve. The Bible says that his ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I'm just painting a picture here of his limitlessness because we're going somewhere. Our God made the beginning in order to inhabit it. Because he was before the beginning. He made it so that he could inhabit it. He created the highest heaven to have a place to be. Somehow, Solomon, in his time, figured out something concerning God. Solomon had finished building the house of God because David wanted to build the house and God said, no, you couldn't do it. And he said, Solomon would do it. And Solomon had this great task to finish building the house of God, and he did it. And the priests, they went into the 
house and they placed the Ark of the Covenant where it was supposed to be. And when they placed it, the scripture says that a cloud filled the house of the Lord. There was just a cloud. It says, and the priests, they could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord, it says. He had finished this great task. And the presence of God just came in. And this experience was so humbling for Solomon. It was humbling for him because, it, it, you know, it could have caused him to be prideful. It could have made him feel that I did this great work for God. Yeah? The Lord said that David, my father, couldn't do it and he gave me the task. And I've done this great work for God. And look, God showed up. You know, and say, wow, look at how God showed up. What a great thing I have done. But instead, it caused Solomon to realize that God had limited himself to come and be a part of their lives. That's what he saw. He said, God who is all. So when God showed up, if we would get that excited about God, that when God shows up, that we would say, oh my God, you limited yourself to come and tabernacle with me. You wanted to be close to me, so you brought yourself in. You, you made yourself small to come and fellowship with me. That is what Solomon saw. He saw that God wanted to be near to them. And the scripture says in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 22, it says that Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the congregation of Israel and he spread forth his hands toward heaven because he was so overwhelmed by the presence of God. He spread forth his hands toward heaven and he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on the earth beneath. He said, there is none like unto you. He was so honored by the presence of God, but God was so real to him. Was so real to him. He had a vision of the God that is. He had that vision. And listen to him. He continued. He says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? He said, I have done this great work for you, almighty God. We want you to come and to be here. He said, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? He said, behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. He said, not just the heaven. You see, because when you get a heaven, then there are dimensions in heaven. He said, the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. The ultimate of heaven cannot contain thee. He said, God, that is who you are. He said, how much less this house that I have built. He was humbled before the presence of God. Solomon understood that God could not be contained. He could not be restrained. He could not be limited. God desires that we see him this way. As a great and awesome and mighty God. He desires that we see him this way. That we understand him like this. That we understand that the God that we come to, he is. He always is. There's might in that. I'll give you one more, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. It says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. He said, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Listen, every throne, every dominion, every principality, every power, all things, it says, were created by him and for him. There is no power that was created that was not created by him 
and for him. And that is why at the end of days, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because they were all created by him and for him. It says, and he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. People, that is our God. That is our God. That is almighty God who is not ashamed to call us his children. He's not ashamed to be called our father. That's our God. He's amazing. He's awesome. He's incredible. He's magnificent. He's almighty. But those are words that are feeble. When you try to describe God with them, they're feeble. Because words have not been created that could really glorify God for who he is. They are not words that could really exalt him in his limitlessness because we don't have the words. You see, if we had the words, then it, he wouldn't be what he is. You know, it, 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 you hear them talk about the, the name of God. That the Jewish people, they would not even say his name. So they, they put no vowels so that they wouldn't say, they said it's like a breath. I can't even remember how they said, it, but it's like yarha, and they just breathe out. They breathe out because he's so holy and so magnificent that they did not even want to speak his name. That is their way of honoring him, honoring him. But God said to the people, he said, there are things that you want to offer to me, but they are already mine. You want to offer it, but it's mine. He said, the silver and the gold, they are mine. He said, you want to give me an offering of bullocks and goats and so, because they took great pride in their offerings. When they would bring it to offer unto the Lord, they took great pride in that. He said, you want to offer me bullock, bullocks and goats, he said, but the cattle on a thousand hills, they are mine. He said, the birds in the air, they're mine. The wild beasts in the field, they're mine. And then he said in Psalm 50 and verse 12, he said, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. He said, why would I tell you? He said, for the world is mine. And the fullness thereof. He said, it's all mine. Get a picture of the God that we serve. You cannot offer me these things, he says. And the psalmist understood that even though there was a command to bring these offerings, he understood how futile it all was. He said, people, I will give you a better idea. He said in Psalm 50 and verse 14, he said, offer unto God thanksgiving. He said, if you want to give him something, he said, I know you're coming with all your things that you feel. I made this and I prepared this for you. He said, but all of that is mine. He said, if you want to give something, he said, offer unto God thanksgiving. He said, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. He said, that is what you could bring and you could offer to him and he will receive it. You want to bless him? Let him know that you understand who he is. Let him know that you understand his bigness, that you recognize that he is without limit. He said, that is how. You can honor him, and that is what we can offer to him. God's whole desire, with all that he has, with all of his expanse, his whole desire is to share himself with his people. He wants to share it with us. He wants us to be partakers of his nature, of his essence, of his goodness, his protection, his provision, his well-being, everything. Do you know that there is no lack? There's no fault. There's no sickness. There's no, there's just nothing that God is missing. He's complete. And he wants his people to share in his wholeness, in his goodness. In, in, in his allness. I know that that's not a word, but we could make up words. 
But when we look at the way that God dealt with his people, it was always in abundance. And this is not a message to tell you to, to pay your tithes and offering. But if you want to pay a tithe and offering, you could pay it. Yeah? It would go a long way. But it was always in abundance. That is how God dealt with them. He said, you want water? He didn't say, I will provide some water for you all. One cup each. Get your cup. Bring your cup. You want water? Bring your cup and I will pour into one cup at a time. No. He said, strike the rock. And the water just flowed. So you say, but God, you're wasting water. It's only up in Simeon Road here we just waste water. Yeah? If you're wasting water, you'll be like, we don't know when water coming again, so don't waste water. But God said, hit the rock. And water is gushing, gushing. And they could just drink how much water they want because that's how God is. As I said, he don't run out. Yeah? He said, you want bread? He just rained bread down from heaven. And bread is covering the floor. They could not, even if they tried to pick up all day and all night, they could not pick up all of the bread. And they're so accustomed to lack. They so have a limited mindset. God said, only pick up what you need for the day. They so have a limited mindset. They're trying to gather more than they could eat. And guess what happened? It turned to worms. Because tomorrow you're getting bread again. You don't have to hoard. Yeah? You could lose that mentality. Because the God that you serve, he has more than enough. Right. You don't have to hoard. It's okay to give to somebody. You know, the little old lady come in trying to get, pick up a little bread, but you're stuffing your bag with bread. You're going to take on some bread and give her a bag, but no, that mentality is when you don't know who your God is. You're only collecting for you. Me and mine, you hug it up. Listen, we're coming into some times just now. If we don't change that mindset. You're hoarding. You're cupboard full. Who's seeing when you... And this is how you're going. God wants us to know he's more than enough. He gives more than enough always. But that is his way. His resources can't run out. The promised land was an expression of how God operates. Deuteronomy chapter 8 from verse 7. You don't have to turn there because they're just running through this. It says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land. Just think about it. When we say the people of God, understand that we too are the people of God. Understand that we have been saved. We are called by his name. We are the people of God. And listen to what he said. He says, for the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land. And most of what he did with these people was a shadow of things to come. When you look at the reality of it, the realness of it, when we, his people, the church, came into being, all of these things apply to us. It says... He bring it into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey. It was abundant, it was rich. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. He said, you'll lack nothing in it. A land whose stones are iron, it has resources, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. He said, when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. He went on, he told them, he said, he said, you're going to build goodly houses. He said, I'm telling you how your life is going to prosper. You're going to build goodly houses and you're going to dwell in them. He said, your herds and your flocks, they will multiply. He said, your silver and your gold will multiply. And all that you have will be multiplied. And in another place, he told them, he said, listen, I am promising you that none of the diseases that I put upon the Egyptians will come upon you. Once you walk in my ways, he said, none of it will come upon you. It reveals the heart of God for his people. The people of God are not even supposed to be sick. Because he said, none of these diseases I will allow to come upon you. If you just walk in my ways. He made provision for everything. 
When you read those scriptures, you see that even when they were walking in the wilderness, their shoes did not wear. Their clothes did not wear. Everything. He said there were serpents, fiery serpents, everything in the wilderness. He said, but God, God protected them. And he shielded them from everything. God so wants his people to walk in his limitlessness. With Abraham, he was always looking for an opportunity to bless Abraham. To make sure that Abraham had more. Do you know that God looks for opportunities to pour out blessings in our lives? I know we don't believe that. Because we have limited thinking. We like to count cents. You know, I remember one time somebody, I don't know if it was my husband, but somebody talking about selling, we want to sell this thing. I said, but if we're going and sell these things, what are we going and count? Dollar, 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 dollar. I want to count 10,000, 10,000. <laughs> I don't want to call, count dollar, dollar. You only count it dollar, 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 dollar. You know what I mean? And I don't want my husband. He said, but dollars that add up is true. But I prefer to count big money. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> So when you put out some labor, you say, you land that whoomp. Yeah? You get a wad whap. <laughs> right? It's not a dollar, 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 dollar. Right? But God was always looking for opportunity to bless Abraham. So guess what happened? Abraham went into the land wherever Abimelech was. Abraham go on there, lie and say that Sarah is his sister. Abimelech now say, hey, she, well, she real nice and so that is his sister. Um, tell her, come. You know? Want to have dinner? Let's have dinner. Listen, as soon as Sarah, as soon as he took Sarah into his place, he did not realize that the judgment of God fell upon him. Eh? He got a dream the night, and the dream is telling him, if you only touch that woman, you're a dead man. He said, but I didn't even know. He said, I didn't even know. The, the, the man said it was his sister. He said, I know you didn't know, but if you touch her, I'll kill you. Right? Listen, don't play with God, you know. You see, there's, there's certain things that God has in place. The man didn't know. You feel you could hear that. We like to feel we could go before God and say, well, Lord, I didn't know. There are laws in the kingdom. There are things. There are things set in place. God don't have to come now and put it there. These laws exist. When you, go, when you breach one of them, it, it acts for itself. Yeah, there are laws. It's the same thing when a person tries to tell us about you have to take care of your body. There are laws. If you don't take care of it and you don't do your part, you, you, we expect this supernatural thing to happen all the time. But there are laws. Yeah, and in many other things too. Right? But anyway, my boy got a dream. And the God, the God said he would kill him. But the moment Abimelech had taken Sarah, the scripture says... That the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech. Every woman, even the maids, everybody's womb was closed. As soon as he did that. And Abimelech had issues too because he had to get, God shut him down. <laughs> even if the wombs weren't closed, Abimelech gets shut down. <laughs> yeah? Because he now had to seek healing from Abraham. But guess what God did? God so wanted to bless Abraham. To break the curse that came upon Abimelech's house. Abimelech gave Abraham sheep, oxen, men servants, women servants. And he gave him a thousand pieces of silver. Abraham left that place rich. Left the place rich. All because God wanted Abraham to have wealth. That's just God's way. An abundance. He likes abundance. So he set, he set this thing up so that this man would do it. And as soon as he gave Abraham all that he did, the curse was lifted from him and his woman folk. But God even tells us, when we jump over to the New Testament, it tells us, in Matthew 6 and verse 25, it says, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. He says, Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? He said, Why are you worrying about these things? 
It says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your Father, your heavenly Father, feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? And when you jump to verse 30, it says, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? He said, O ye of little faith. In other words, he was saying, you have a very small perception of who I am. You have not seen me. If these are the things that you are worrying about, then you don't even understand who I am. You don't understand my limitlessness. He said, you have little faith. You have no revelation of the limitlessness of God. And he said, because of this, because you don't have that right perception, your need is magnified. Your desires are magnified. You are magnified. When we don't understand who God is, we become magnified in the situation. The mountains before us become magnified in a situation. When you understand the limitlessness of your God, you could be running from Pharaoh's army. You can see that there are mountains on either side and that there is water before you and it will not be an issue. You see, Moses was still getting there, but if he was at the point where he understood what he understood by the time he was getting to the end of his life, he would have known that there's no issue here because the God that we serve, he's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. That is just who he is. It's just who he is. Water is nothing. God could have gone either anyway. He could have wiped them out in the back. He could have moved the two mountains. He could move the water. You see, sometimes we don't know which way you're going to go, Lord. But learn from Moses. Just keep going forward. Just keep going forward. No matter what the situation is, when the enemy is on your track, don't stop to wonder what to do. Run sideways, what to Go forward. Just keep going forward. The Lord said, what, Moses, what are you praying about? You need to know who God is by now. Just lift up your hand. Yeah? And watch God work. This is, this is what we need to know. Because when we don't understand the limitlessness of God, our situation seems big. And we ourselves seem big. Why does God go out of his way to make sure that we understand his limitlessness? It is because of this very danger. When we don't see God, we exalt ourselves. When we don't see God, we exalt our needs. We exalt our desires. We exalt our own passions. We even exalt our own works. When we don't see him. If Solomon had not seen God, he would have exalted himself as doing something great for God. Instead of seeing that his great God was coming to be with him. You see the difference in perspective? You see how it affects your sight? Scripture says that the goodness of God leads man to repentance. It leads us to humility. It causes man to put himself in perspective to God, in relation to God. So it becomes God and us, and not us and God. You know, in a way, so many of us, we have this thing so upside down. Because we see ourselves, our, we are big in our eyes. So instead of seeing God and us, we see us and God. And that has to shift. That has to shift. Because everything is supposed to be about God. I know that as we live in this world, that's a very hard statement for us to fathom. But everything, everything 
is supposed to be about God. When Jesus wanted to change Peter's perspective, he wanted to shift his focus from himself and what he had to offer to who Jesus was. You know what, what, what Jesus did? He blessed him. He showed him his goodness because the goodness of God brings man to repentance. So Jesus had borrowed Peter's boat. He said, Peter, I know you fished all night and so the boat was still there. He said, just lend me the boat. Let's go out a bit. I want to share a little bit with the people. And so Peter was probably feeling good about himself that, you know, Jesus is using my boat. I was able to offer my boat to be used to Jesus. And, you know, Jesus is using my boat to share with the people. Guys, it's my boat. Yeah, it's, it's me. Jesus chose me. Yeah. And then when it was done, Jesus said, go out a little bit into the deep. He said, so that you could catch some fish. And Peter was like, Lord, I'm telling you, we are fishermen. He said, I have fisherman since I'm small. Right? We don't fish in the daytime. You see all this hot sun? No fish. No fish bite in this hour. Right? But because it was Jesus, he said, let's do it. Jesus said, cast out the net. He said, go. make sure, go deep. And when he cast the net, to his shock and surprise, every fish that was in the area got a call and everybody was rushing into the net when they started to pull up the net the net started to break it started to break and the ship it's pulling down the ship they had to call one of their partners and say come and take some of this fish but when this happened it affected peter it affected him because it's as if he looked at the fish and he saw what had happened and he said, how is this happening? And he looked at Jesus and immediately the bigness of God hit him. And Peter said, depart from me for I am a sinful man. It humbled him. When he saw the greatness of God, it humbled him that with all that he was, and all the filth that still existed in him, that Jesus would do such a thing. That he would show him such a thing. It blew his mind. It humbled him. It said, the scripture says, for he was astonished. He couldn't believe it. It humbled him. That is what happens when you start to see God. You start to diminish you start to become less and less. What was Jesus doing? He was shifting Peter's perspective of God. He was shifting all of them who had this experience. He was shifting their thinking. There's nothing really that we can do for God. Because everything is his. So God showed him. Flesh and its desires are supposed to diminish in the, in the presence of God. It is supposed to become less and less about us and more and more about him. Everything that we do or desire in this life is supposed to be about God and not ourselves. You say, Rev, that's just something that preachers say. I am telling you it is not that. It is the truth. It's a big statement, but it is the truth. There is so much that God wants to give us access to, but we cannot touch it until it is not about us. Until it is not about us. Rev, what are you talking about? How could what I need not be about me? Because I'm the one who needs it. How it, could be, how it could not be about me? How could my desires not be about me? They're my desires. How is this possible? I know that it sounds like some kind of mystery. It sounds like some kind of big secret. But if it's a secret to anything, it's the secret to tapping into his limitlessness. It's one of the secrets as to why we are not living in the abundance that God desires for his people. 
It's one of them because we don't make everything about him. It is one of the secrets as to why we are not walking in the fullness of divine health and divine protection and divine provision. And as Apostle adds, Satan is not able to touch us. This is one of the reasons because it's not about him. Turn with me to James chapter 4 and verse 1. We're familiar with these verses, but we're going to read it. The scripture says, are we there? From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts? And lust, we want to understand here, is strong, the strong desires of our flesh. It's our greed. It's our covetousness. That is what the lust is. He said, doesn't it come even of your lusts that war in your members? We say, Lord, I'm a Christian. I don't lust. He said in verse 2, he said, you lust. Your flesh craves it and you have not. He said, you kill and desire to have. You want it so bad. You're willing to kill. Even if you have to assassinate somebody's character to get what you want. You want it so bad. If you have to cut somebody down, we will do that because you want it so bad. Because you'll say, I'll never kill. But we kill our brethren so many times. It's a good thing, you know. When you're killing the brethren, it's like them games. You know, you just have three lives. You play and then you, you fall off the cliff. And you die, so you lose a life. And think, here yeah, no, is a good thing. When you kill us, we don't just die and it's done. And we, have, we have lives. Yeah? We just come back. You'll be like, you still here? <laughs> yeah, you kill us, but we're still here. <laughs> right? He says, you kill and you desire to have. And you cannot obtain. You fight and war. Just think about lust is passion. Lust has passion. Lust has fire in it. He says you fight and you war because you must have this thing and you cannot obtain. He said you have not because you ask not. He said you do not even pray about it. He said you're there fighting, fighting, fighting in your flesh to get there. But you will not even pray about it. You will not seek the face, about, face of God about it. Because God is not limited. In fact, God says that if we ask without wavering, we will get whatever we ask for. Yeah? He said, but you're fighting up with all the passion that you have. He said, but you wouldn't even ask. He said, well, okay, I will ask. He said, you ask and receive not. Because you ask amiss. He says, it is amiss because you ask that you may consume it upon your lusts. He said, on your greed to satisfy the cravings of your flesh. To fill your desires. To satisfy your soul. He said, that is why you're asking. Because it's about you. It's all about you. You and what you need is just magnified. It's huge. It's big. He said, and it's creating a passion. Because listen, when you need something, when flesh feels like it needs something, it's like an animal. It feels it must have must be satisfied. And it's easy to differentiate between the lust of evil pleasures because we'll say, I'm not into evil pleasures and sinful practices. And that's true for many of us. But do you know that we can lust for things that are not sinful and still consume it upon our flesh? 
It might not be sin sinful at all. You know, there's a place in God that when our lives really, it's, it's not about sin. It's not about sin. It's more about defilement and contamination of flesh. It's not about running down to fornicate and all these things. But it's more about flesh. You just feel like you, you just gave too much time to cater into the flesh. And when you spend too much time catering to the flesh and not enough of the spirit, you'll be like, but did I sin? What it is that happened? You start to feel almost sick on the inside because you start to feel like, hmm, something went off balance. Yeah? The equilibrium went off. Do you know that when in the natural, when your balance goes off, you feel nausea? There's a nausea that you feel in the spirit. When that, that went off, when you're supposed to be feeding more of the spirit than the flesh, and that balance goes off, you feel, you feel sick. But it wasn't really about sin. It was about flesh. You lusted for things. But lust has many faces. Even sanctimonious faces. Our desires could seem so noble, so holy, so righteous. But when you pull it apart, you realize that it is rooted in self. And it's rooted in pride. It's feeding something in us that we're not even aware of. A lot of the times when we think we're doing something good, it's feeding something. And we don't know what it's feeding. Our soul calls out for something. And we just know that the soul wants it. But many times we don't know how to discern between our soul and our spirit. So the soul is crying out for it to satisfy something. But we can't discern. Because the scripture tells us that it is the word of God that is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It could be so close that the word of God comes in and is able to identify for us what is of the soul and what is of the spirit. Because a lot of times the desire that the soul is crying out for, it is flesh that injected that. And we understand about the dual nature of man. But when God is injecting into the spirit, you need to know when it's your spirit that's communicating. And when it's soulish. But he says the word of God will identify that. Look at these sons of thunder. James and John, they desired to sit on the right hand of Jesus, right and the left. They sent their mother to do their dirty work, right? But they wanted to sit on the right and the left of, of Jesus. It seemed noble. We want to be next to you, Jesus, but it was rooted in flesh. What about Simon the sorcerer? Look at what he was desiring. He wanted to be able to lay hands on people so that they could receive the Holy Spirit. If you take that at face value, you'll be like, what's wrong with that? You don't want to lay hands? We want to lay hands. But it was covetous. He wanted it to consume on his flesh. He wanted to be seen as somebody. And these things are going on in the church all the time. We're desiring the things of God. We desire the gifts of God. We desire for God to move. We desire all these things. And if when we get down to the root of it, you will say, why are we asking? And it's not happening. You say, it's because. Check the motives. Check to see if the things that you're craving for yourself has anything to do with God. Or if it just has to do with us check to see. Because we need the word to discern between soul and spirit. Why do we want what we want? Every desire that proceeds from man is rooted in flesh. It is rooted in greed. It is rooted in covetousness and self-gratification. Every desire that proceeds from man. But every desire that proceeds from God is rooted in purity. Rooted in his will and in his purpose. 
if it proceeds from God. Desires need to be discerned and purified by the word of God. And that's why Jesus said, he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, he says, you will ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. In other words, Jesus is saying, you could ask whatever you will and it's going to be done. Because he's saying that you will somehow tap into the limitlessness of God. Whatever you ask for, you'll get it. How? He says, because our will gets purged and purified by his word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that is what changes the context of what we will ask for. It changes the context. All of a sudden, the things we desire will change. The passions that we have will change. What we ask for is different. And because we don't desire to consume it on our flesh, guess what happens? God will grant it. God will grant it. When Solomon became king, he was so overwhelmed. He had a dream from God. He got an open check from God. God said, ask what I will give thee. Solomon was like, wow, ask what I will give thee. What if God were to ask some of us, ask what I, what, what I should give thee? We start already. Long life. A million dollars in the bank. And you ask for a million, a million dollars is nothing these days. You're smart, you ask for a hundred times, two hundred times, three hundred times. I could keep going. A thousand times that. Yeah? But we, we gone all there. But Solomon, something... He had a different kind of heart. And the scripture says that he said to God, he said, give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. He said, God, you gave me a job to do and I need to be able to do it. He said, give me wisdom and knowledge. He says, for well, who can judge this, thy people, that is so great? And God said to Solomon, because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked for riches, wealth, or honor. Could have asked for honor. He said, nor did you ask for the life of thine enemies. He said, neither yet hast thou asked for long life. He said, didn't even, didn't even ask for a long life. If we honest with ourselves, check yourself. You'll be like, what will I tell God? I have an open check. What will I say? He said, but has asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself. That thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. He says, wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee. Just as you asked. He said, but Solomon, you have tapped into something that others didn't know how to tap into. He said, you tapped into the limitlessness of God. He said, because apart from wisdom and knowledge, I will give thee riches. I will give thee wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee. Neither shall there any after thee have like he said, Solomon, I'm going to blow you out of the water. Because you unlocked something. When you put my desires above your desires. When all you could see is my limitlessness. All you could see is what is available. Because of who God is. He tapped into the limitlessness of God. He didn't ask for, for, for long life, but I believe that God gave him long life. Because when he was writing Ecclesiastes and all those things, he was old, he was reminding them, when you're young, remember the Lord. In your youth, the Lord gave him that. But when James continued, he said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses. He was talking to them about 
they lost and how much of themselves that they see. Everything is just about them. He said, you adulterers and adulteresses. You see, when we lost after anything but God, you say, but in this life, could you really desire nothing but God? You know, in heaven, everything is about God. Nobody is trying to get any attention. That's why they had to kick Satan out. He couldn't come back up. Because he was making things about him. In heaven, all anybody is interested in is what pleases God. What do you want? How can I serve? It's all about you. Everything is centered around God. All the excitement is around God's throne. It's about God. So if you feel, you're going up there to say, I take in today off, yes? <laughs> Not in God's heaven. You better start getting excited about God from here because you're supposed to be transitioning from one to the other. Some of us, he might really have to put some of us in the second heaven to wait. Let them demons beat you up a little bit. You, <laughs> you're there in the second heaven. You say, well, Lord, what are you doing here? I'm trying to get you ready before you can go up there because you can't make too much of us. Too much of what we want. Are we tired? Are we sleepy? Are we can't get up, Lord? You can't wait. You can't wait with me. A few, say, listen. I, I let it out some people files here. I had to pray the other morning. I, I, I was with some friends and they say, we pray in three o'clock in the morning. So we wait until three o'clock come. So they're doing good and they're waiting. Three o'clock. Because three o'clock is the time and we're up late already. So they say, well, just stay up till three. We will stay up and think. Man, I'm watching them wilt one by one. Who lean up? <laughs> they lean up, you know. From the time I see the posture, I tell myself, hmm, they ain't making it. But when it's three o'clock, I say, all right, prayer start. So I start to pray. I hear him, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> and then ever so often, you see like, a, then you hear, you in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. <laughs> yes, Lord. I say, oh, they're like them three disciples that went with Jesus. Could you not wait? Could you not wait with me? <laughs> you know, them three disciples, <laughs> the spirit willing, Lord. But the flesh is weak. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to pray. <laughs> we, we tired. But listen, when we lost after anything but God, we are adulterers. That's how God sees it. Adulterers. He never wants our desire even to be for the things that he provides. He wants us to have it, but he said your desire cannot be for the things that he provides. Our desire must be for him and his kingdom. Listen to how it says it in the living Bible. He says, you are like an unfaithful wife who loves her husband's enemies. <laughs> Believe that? When it says, you adulterers and adulteresses, it says you are like an unfaithful wife who loves her husband's enemies. You know what it is to love your husband's enemies? You're getting put out. Not just love somebody else, you know, your husband's enemy. He says, don't you realize that making friends with God's enemies, the evil pleasures of this world, makes you an enemy of God? He's talking about the lust and the greed and the covetousness. All the things that's magnified above God. That's what we see when we don't know who he is and see who he is. Yet do you know that God has good things for us? He says, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. How do you walk uprightly with God? You need to understand who he is. Understand that he is. That he always is. That he's limitless. That there's nothing other than him. Jesus even said, he said, fear not little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. His whole desire is to give it to us. You know, there's a purity in desiring something because God says it's ours. It's okay if God says, this is what I've provided for you. 
so that it's not about the thing, but it's about the fact that God wants it for us. I don't know if I could bring understanding to that, to that concept. But you know how when people try to say that they're, they're humble, they try to deny who God says that they are in order to be humble. So you don't want nobody to know. You say, no, not me. I really can't do that. And so, but acknowledging who God said you are is what God sees. And that's not for pride. That is to understand that I am aligning myself with what God says. So in that same way, when we embrace the life that God wants for us, it's, it cannot be about the things it has to be that God has said, this is what, this is how I should live. This is my legacy. This is my heritage. And so you accept it because of that, and that blesses God. Because it means that you believed that he is. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But the moment you start to make it about the stuff, Defilement comes in. The moment the thing touches our hearts, it has the potential to defile. Greed defiles. The cravings of the flesh, it defiles. Wanting stuff for no reason defiles. Just recently I said, you know, I want to, I want to get so and so and whatever going to organize this. And the Lord said, no, no, no. You don't need it. And I was like, but I don't need it. And then he showed me, he said, that's greed, what you need it for. You have one that working. Use it. I have a bed that's hurt my back sometimes. <laughs> but even that, you have a bed to lie down on, sleep on it until the Lord make a better for you because we just get greedy. Just get greedy. And it's have some things that we don't have to have. You don't have to buy another one. And another this and another that. And get stuff. It's greed. You don't have to look like this one and look like that one. You only watch it. Listen, covetousness has overtaken. Not just the world, but even the church, you know. We only study in, oh, look how this one look. I want to look like that. So you got you to do your face. So you got to do your hair. So you, all of that is, is making life about things. That's not God. God wants us to have good things. But why? 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 We have to focus. Everything is, I need, I need, I want, I want. The Bible says something about some leeches. It said they're never satisfied. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. More, more, more. Yeah? We have to guard against that because it's a pollution. There's a defilement. But God wants to share everything with us. But if it's, but not if it's about us. And guess what? You cannot fake you cannot fake tapping into the limitlessness of God. You can't fake it. There's a way that you get in there. And that way has to be true and genuine. I've given you one more example. I'm supposed to be done by now. but Hannah had been weeping for a son. She wanted the reproach of her barrenness to be removed from her life. It was hard. It was hard for her. She was being provoked and taunted by, the scripture says, her adversary. And guess who the adversary was? Penina. Penina had sons and daughters, and Hannah was barren. And the scripture says that her adversary provoke, provoked her sore for to make her fret. So anytime she had to pass with her children... I have kids. Where are your kids? Where are your, where are your kids, Hannah? Hannah, you have no kids. Yeah? She had a pass with the kids. She had, to, she had to tell them, oh, look, so and so. It's so and so's birthday today, you know? Yeah, so and so's birthday. And provoking Hannah, it says, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And for years, Hannah was crying out to God. Every year, she, the husband, the whole family, they would go up to make sacrifice in a place called Shiloh. And every year she would go and she would cry out because she, she, she wanted this so bad. But there was no answer. And all the while, God wanted to remove the reproach as well. Believe me, God wanted to remove that reproach. But something had to switch in her. Hannah, 
What do you want the sun for? To parade before Penina? Because she was laughing at you? You want a son because of revenge? You want to prove to yourself that nothing is wrong with you? You want to make sure that you're secure because you're telling yourself, if I keep going so, next thing, my husband had turned toward Penina with all her children. But her husband had loved her. Elkanah, he loved her. He loved her. He gave her greater portions of everything. He said, you can't have any children, so I'll give you some extra. She's still crying. I want a child. But God was waiting for a change. And one day, Hannah's heart switched. And her prayer changed. You see, you cannot pretend with God. If you are to tap in and get in there, you have to cross that border legally. You can't pretend. And so her prayer changed because her heart changed. And God got the switch. And because before that she was praying amiss, it was for her lust. And the scripture says, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and she wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. She said, God, I am going to make this thing about you and I'm going to do it genuinely. She said, you give me a child, I'll give him to you. I'll give all of him to you. It says, she, and she said, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Hannah got to the place where she genuinely wanted a son so that she could give him back to God. When we could get to the place where the thing that we desire, we say, God, I want this for your service. You save my life, God. I will use up my life for your kingdom. You see, God knows when you're trying to mama guy him and blackmail him. And he knows when it's genuine. He knows when it's genuine. In 2015, when I couldn't breathe, I couldn't walk from here to here, can't breathe. Pulmonary embolism. But when I realized that I could take a breath again, I said, God, I'm going to use my breath for you. I'm using it up. You can't stop me from talking. <laughs> I talk. And when I realized that I could run up steps again, you can ask my husband, I'm always running up the step. Running up the step. Why run up the step? Because I can. Because there was a time when I couldn't. And I will use up my voice for God. Listen, if I could teach Bible study every day, I will teach Bible study. It might not nobody to teach. I'll teach it every day. Because I'll use it up for the Lord. And he knows that. You give me another chance of using it until it run out. But she was genuine. And she said, I will give him back to God. She tapped into the limitlessness of God. Because guess what happened after? She weaned the child. And she took him. And she gave him over to Eli in the temple. And she said, okay. I did it just as the Lord said. And the scripture says in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife. And said, the Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. Say, you, you loaned Samuel to the Lord, your whole son. You took him and you gave him to God. He says, for that reason, may the Lord give you seed of this woman. And they went on to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah. So that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. Play with God. When you are able to tap in to the limitlessness of God, you get everything that you wanted. But she had to cross over genuinely. She had to put God first. 
God's method of blessing is always to take the focus off of flesh first. Deprive flesh first. And then he will increase. The scripture says, cast thy bread upon the water. You say you want bread? Cast it on the water. He said, and when you cast it on the waters, thou shalt find it after many days. He said, you want it, so give it. You need it, so give it. That's how you tap into the limitlessness of God. He says, give, and it shall be given unto thee. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over will men give into your bosom. You're talking about abundance and limitlessness. He said, give, and this is what will happen. Let go of the thing that you want. Give it over. Give the thing that you feel that you need. Give it over. Let go of the desire. Release it. Some things we need to kill. And watch God start to bring in the unlimited provision. The scripture says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. You have to let it go if you want to have it. That's how you cross over. He said, take no thought. When he told them, take no thought in the way that the Gentiles do. He said, because I'm going to show you how to get into the limitlessness of God. He says, seek ye first. God's principles are all over the scripture. He said, if you want to really see me in your midst, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these things, all of the limitlessness of God will be available to you. He said, all of these things shall be added unto you. Everything. But seek my kingdom first. Remember when Elijah came upon this widow woman? And she was about, she had just meal and some oil. She was about to make her last meal. And they were going to die. He said, make a meal for me first. God has a principle. Make a meal for me first. And when she made it for him first, the oil and the meal did not run out. She tapped into the limitlessness of God. When God says, bring ye all the tithes into the, into the storehouse. He said, bring it into the storehouse that there will be meat in my house. He said, and prove me now therewith. If I will not pour, open up the, the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that, guess what? That you will not be able to contain it. You will not have room enough to contain it. We're talking about getting into the limitlessness of God. But what you have to do first, what you want to hold on to it to do, let it go. Give it up and watch God move. Tap into the limitlessness of God. There's a way to get there and I'm telling you, everything has to be about him. Take your focus off of all that you want and decide, God, it's for you. It's for you. Make him the center of everything. Make him the center of your life. I know it sounds as though we're just selling dreams, but I'm telling you something sinister has happened to the people of God. And what has happened is that our eyes have been on the things that are bigger to us. The Lord says, store up your treasures in heaven. He says, store it in heaven where thieves cannot break in and steal. But when we try to hold on to everything here and we must have and we must have, everything is magnified. We are magnified. And the Lord said that there's such a greed that has come into the church, even a greediness and a covetousness for spiritual things to consume it upon our flesh. What do we need some things for? You're telling God, I want to do this better than anybody. I want to rise up with this. For what? If he tells you to get up and go to Biafra, you're going? But you want all this thing. Wherever he sends you, if he tells you 
to go in a rough neighborhood like here. Are you going? There's some things he's not going to give us because he knows. God doesn't cast pearls to swine. Even though he can't miss out on it, he won't lose anything, but he will not cast his pearls to swine. He will give it to those who will make good use of it. And he knows the difference. I believe that the Lord just wants to purge out some of those lusts, the greediness. You know, there was a time when the people of Israel, they just became greedy. God was providing manna for them every day and they said, we're tired of this manna, manna. There's only manna, manna, manna. We want some meat. Give us some meat. And God realized that they were defiled. He realized that the desires of their heart, it was evil. He said, you want meat? He said, I'll give you meat. And you know when God given, he given an abundance, he said, man, I will send quail. You will get quail. He said, you will eat quail till quail coming out your nose. You so want it. Some of us, the things that we're going through now is quail. You wanted it. And God gave it to you. And now it's coming out of your nose. And you're saying, oh gosh. Lord, I don't want this. I won't want it. But that is what you're nagging God for. You are nagging him. This is what I want. This is what I want. And you're only behind God. He said, this is what you want. Go ahead. And now you're saying, oh gosh, Lord. Have mercy. I don't want no more quail. I don't want to see another bird in my life. Give me some manna, Lord. I will take manna, manna. Give me anything that you want to give, but take away the quail. I don't want no quail. I call it the curse of the quail. The curse of the quail. Because that happens if we ignore God's call to purge out the greediness and the ingratitude and all of these things. I don't, I not, trust me, I'm not beating up on you all, you know. I really only sharing this because I know that God wants us to be able to cross over into that other realm of limitlessness with him. But it can't happen unless it's all about him. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Just lift your hands in the house of God tonight. Just genuinely go before him. Genuinely bear your heart before him. There's no one that knows hearts better than our God. There's no one who sees what is genuine and what is not. There's no one that understands the motives of the heart. Whatever it is, listen, even if it is a great need that you have. The Lord is saying tonight, can you choose me above? Can you see my limitlessness? I have something for you, but unless you're willing to lay down what you have, I can't take you where I want to take you. Unless you're willing to just give it all up. Even our lives, he said, if you save your life, you will lose it. He said, but if you give him your life, you will save it. Is our lives more valuable to us than him? Oh my God, what a question. Is our life more valuable to us than him? I tell you, if it is, we rob ourselves from entering into his fullness, the beauty of who he is. Everything has to be about him. He has to be our number one. 
I know you're going through stuff, but it has to be our number one. Everything has to be about him. Lay it down on the altar tonight. Lay it down upon the altar. Cast your bread. Give out of your need. Sacrifice unto the Lord. Whatever is needed, you know your situation. Some things are not birthed but by sacrifice. What will you offer God today? He doesn't want what is His already. He wants what we are holding on to. What are we holding on to? That is more dear to us than him. Oh, Sharabaki on the Rabasai. Holy Spirit, do what flesh and blood cannot do tonight. Almighty oh, God, your word has been spoken. And Spirit of the living God, come and purge out, oh God. Purge out, oh God, the greed the desires, the must-haves. Purge us, O oh God, tonight. Purge us, O oh God, with hyssop. Mighty God, Apostle spoke about baptism by fire. And that fire comes to burn. It comes to burn out those things, O oh God, that defile. It comes, O oh God, to burn up the chaff. The very things that keep us out of your presence, O oh God, the fire comes to burn. If we in this house could just find that place on the altar tonight. To just lift up whatever it is that stands between you and God. Because God says that you love his enemies more than you love him you love his enemies he says we are adulterers and adulteresses God our desire is to live 100% for you and we know it is possible because you will not say to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that all things will be available to us, O oh God, will be added to us. You will not say these things, O oh God, if it was not a pathway into all that you are. Oh, precious Jesus. Hallelujah. What song you have? Oh, precious Lord. All that we have, all that we have, oh God. All that we have, oh Jesus. See him tonight. See him tonight. Oh, if our eyes will be open tonight, if our eyes will be open to see him, there will be no need that is greater than him. There will be no desire or passion that is greater than him. Open our eyes tonight, oh God, to see our great Messiah. To see you, oh God, in your greatness, Lord. Shurabakiandarebebesikarababakai. Oh, are we entering in? Are we entering in? I can't make you enter. I can't make you enter. You have to want it. You have to want it. You have to want it. Change your song to something that could work, please. Shurabakiandarebebesikarababasaka. 
Oh Lord God, all that we have, all that we have, all that we have. All that we have, shondo roba ba kora ba ba si kara ba ba kie. Oh, Spirit of the Living God, Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of the Lord. Shora ba si kora ma ma sanda rebebe kie. Oh Lord God, just come and burn, come and burn us, oh Lord God. Is there a song with burn, with burning? Burn in me, go ahead, yes. Yeah. Oh, come on, just lift your hands and let's ask him to burn in us. Burn in us, oh God. Burn in us, oh God. Burn in us, invite him, invite him. This is how we prepare ourselves for what Apostle is preparing us for. Invite the fire of God. Ask him to burn in me, burn in me, oh God. Burn out the things that are keeping me out of your fullness, oh God. Come with your fire, come with your flames. Don't be afraid of the fire of God. Don't be afraid of the flames of God. He loves us and when he comes to purge, he knows what to keep and he knows what to burn up. The things that are chaff, the things that are dross, he will burn them out, he will flush them out. But the things that are gold, he will keep. What is refined, he will keep. Invite the fire tonight. Invite the fire. We singing something. Oh, precious Jesus. Burn in me, Lord.
just do this old song, Spirit of the Living God, just fall afresh upon me. Just yield yourself to Him. He's the one that does the work. He just needs us to make ourselves available. We cannot make our own hearts genuine. But when we surrender to Him, He will do the work. Don't drop. Limited 
and we because our hearts could take it Lord oh precious Lord see us tonight hear the genuine genuine prayer of our hearts tonight and receive us Lord receive us Lord Jesus hallelujah hallelujah is there anybody here tonight that you want to ask Jesus into your heart we don't want to miss the opportunity if you want to ask Jesus to come into your heart anybody tonight you could keep the keep the moon there anybody we just don't want you to miss you want to say that prayer I see people ask it hallelujah Jesus okay Introducing the Know the Truth series by Dr. Austin DeBoog. It will open your eyes to God's truth on four misunderstood and misrepresented Christian teachings. Saints. Conferring sainthood upon dead people contradicts God's word. Communion. Infinitely more than a mundane ritualistic tradition. The Church. God's church is not a man-made religion. And praying versus saying prayers. Praying as Jesus taught is not just reciting someone else's words. If you think wrong, you will believe wrong and you will act wrong. Too many of us are accepting wrong Christian beliefs. This blinds us to the truth of God's infallible word and robs us of God's abundant blessings. This book series challenges you to take a closer look at what you've been taught. It will revolutionize your thinking. It is time to know the truth. You're all